What is Christianity? Part 8. Letters of Peter a doubt could arise here. The New Testament contains two letters written by Peter. In these letters Peter has expounded the same theories as those of Paul. In fact, in the second letter he has written to the following extent. So also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him speaking of this as he does in all his letters. Pet 315. It appears therefore that there was no difference of opinion between Peter and Paul. The answer is that according to Christian scholars, the ascription of both letters to Peter is incorrect. Either the letters were written by another whose name was Peter or somebody deliberately ascribed the letters to Peter the disciple. In regard to the first letter, the Encyclopedia Britannica says, Britannica, Volume 17, p. 642, Article Peter. The question of date and authorship are closely connected, for many critics have maintained that the contents of the epistle imply a date subsequent to the death of St. Peter. References to persecution occur in I.6, 2.12, 4. 12-19, V9, the recipients are undergoing a fiery trial, they have to bear approach, and to inquire an evil reputation. These are very similar conditions to those implied in Priwe's letter to Trajan, and therefore it is argued that I. Peter belongs to the same period and was written long after the Apostle's death. The encyclopedia shows by means of further proof that the first letter was not that of Peter. The position of the second letter is even more delicate than the first letter. In explaining its position, the encyclopedia says, As I. Peter was the first of the Catholic epistles to be admitted into the canon, so 11. Peter was the last. It was accepted at Alexandria in the 3rd century, thence it passed into the canon of the Church of Constantinople. But not until the 4th century was it accepted at Rome, and the Syrian Church admitted it in the 6th century. The cumulative weight of the following objections to its authenticity is generally held to disprove its claim to Petrine authorship. A. Origen, the first to mention it as Petrine, admits that its authorship was disputed. B. The style, language and thought not only differ from I. Peter but from the rest of the New Testament. C. References to immorality associated with false teaching seem to belong to a date much later than that of the Apostle Peter. D. The incorporation of Jude makes Petrine authorship improbable. E. The attribution of scriptural authority to the Pauline epistles, 316, points to a date not earlier than the 2nd century. It may have been written in Egypt, where it first appears. Or a Deisman thinks it may have originated in Asia Minor. The above clearly proves that Christian scholars themselves refuse to accept the letters as the work of Peter. Hence one cannot claim on the basis of these two letters that Peter agreed with Paul, and that there was no difference between the two. James and Paul. At the time of Jesus, John was the name of three persons. 1. Yagu Bibin Halafi, James the son of Alphaeus, who was called James the Younger and who was only mentioned amongst the list of disciples. Or with those women who gathered at the time of crucifixion, Mark 1540. Apart from Tihiz, there is no reference to him in the New Testament. 2. Yagu Bibin Zebedee, James the son of Zebedee, who was the brother of John the disciple. He was killed by King Herod a little after the ascension of Jesus to the heavens. Acts 12 2, hence, he did not have any specific contact with Paul during his lifetime. And he passed away prior to the Council of Jerusalem. 3. Yagu Bibin Yusuf Najar, James the Carpenter, who is declared by the Bible to be the brother of Jesus. Matt 13 21, John 7 5, or he brought faith in the last stage of Jesus' life, or according to Paul, Christ appeared to him at the resurrection, Cor, 1, 15 7. The Acts indicate that he was the head of the Council of Jerusalem and hence he proclaimed its decision. Acts 15 19. Although he ruled that circumcision and adherence to the law of Torah was not a precondition to embracing the Christian faith. It is almost unanimously accepted by Christian scholars that this ruling was temporary. Whereas, he was a very strict adherent of the law of Torah. James McKinnon Britannica, Volume 17, P.642, Article Peter, First Epistle to the Rites. With this comparatively liberal policy the conservative party, though fain to comply for the time being, was by no means satisfied, even James, whilst waiving the demand for circumcision, retained scruples on the score of the free fellowship of Jewish and Gentile believers, so great was his authority that Peter and even Barnabas, refrained from eating with the Gentiles, p. 95. At another place he writes in regard to James McKinnon, p. 95, and it is evident from Josephus' brief notice, as well as from the longer account Hegesippus, that his austere character and his observance of the law wound the goodwill of the Jews. P. 119. Then, it is surprising that after the Council of Jerusalem, the Acts mentioned James at only one place, Acts 17.26. There also James requested Paul to purify himself for opposing the law of Torah, and advised him to abide by that law. At least, it is established that James was not in agreement with Paul's theories which is ascribed to James. In this regard, James McKinnon McKinnon, P.119 says, and the weight of evidence is not in favor of his, James, authorship. P. 120. John and Paul. 
After Peter and Barnabas, John the son of Zebedee occupies that highest status amongst the disciples. According to McKinnon, he is regarded as one of the three pillars of the church. Strangely, John also like Peter and Barnabas, is not referred to in the Acts after the Council of Jerusalem. Thereafter, his condition is unknown. James McKinnon McKinnon, P.120, writes. Like Peter, John disappears from the narrative in Acts after the Jerusalem conference at which he is still prominent as one of the three pillars of the church, where he evangelized after leaving Jerusalem is unknown. P. 118. We can therefore safely infer that John also like Peter and Barnabas, separated himself from Paul and the Council of Jerusalem due to theological differences. It appears that John then attempted to spread the true teachings of Christianity. For this reason, the pupils of Paul did not consider him worthy of mention after the Council of Jerusalem. There remains for consideration the Gospel of John and three letters ascribed to John in the New Testament. We have stated previously that the Christian scholars are virtually unanimous that their author is not John, the disciple, but John the Elder. Other Disciples These are the disciples who are mentioned in the Acts or in the New Testament. Apart from them, the condition of the other disciples are even more clouded. It is not even established whether Paul met them or not. James McKinnon McKinnon, P.118 writes, Of the later mission work of the rest of the twelve there is little authentic to tell. It assigns to them various mission spheres from Gaul to India, Eusebius takes Thomas to Parthia, which then included the northern fringe of India, whilst the acts of Thomas take him direct to India by way of Egypt and the Indian Ocean. Bartholomew likewise goes to India and Andrew to Scythia, north of the Black Sea. Thaddeus proceeds to Odessa, whose king of Gaul had exchanged letters with Jesus, and Julie heals the king and converts many of his subjects. Needless to say, these tales are very largely pure fiction. It is possible that Thomas and Bartholomew found their way to India though the exact region covered by this term is doubtful. P. 121. Conclusions. The following is established from the above discussion of the twelve disciples. 1. From the twelve disciples, two had died prior to the council of Jerusalem, namely James son of Zebedee and Judas Iscariot. 2. We do not know the condition of seven disciples after the ascent of Jesus to the heavens, namely, James, Thomas, Bartholomew, Thaddeus, Philip, Matthew and Andrew. 3. From amongst the remaining three, we have established that Barnabas and Peter separated themselves from Paul after the Council of Jerusalem on grounds of serious and fundamental theological and doctrinal differences. There remains only John son of Zebedee, whose reference is mentioned before is suddenly omitted after the Council of Jerusalem, just as in the case of Peter and Barnabas. The above analysis manifestly shows that the disciples supported Paul, and certified him as true, as long as he did not take any steps to distort Christian teachings. But, after the Council of Jerusalem, when Paul proclaimed his revolutionary theories, and expounded them in his letter to the Galatians, his first letter, all the disciples then living separated from him. Hence, it is potentially wrong to conclude on the basis of the events that led to the Council of Jerusalem that the disciples concurred in Paul's theories of Trinity, Incarnation, Redemption etc. The reality is that the founder of these theories Paul, and such theories have no connection whatsoever with Jesus or his disciples. Opponents of Paul. The question naturally arises if Paul had in reality distorted and altered the Christian faith, and established a new religion which was contrary to the teachings of Jesus. Why did effective opposition to him not emerge with the result that his theories became prevalent in the Christian world, and the true Christianity disappeared? If we search for the answer to this question in the pages of history, we clearly discover that Paul and his theories were most strongly opposed during the first three centuries. And that the opponents of Paul at that time were not less influential, in effect and number, than Paul himself. But when, by chance in the third century, Christianity was declared the official state religion of the Byzantine Empire, the protectors and supporters of Paul dominated the government of that day. And they not only attempted to exterminate the opponents of Paul but also to destroy all the material on which the opponents of Paul could base their arguments. The result was that the religion of Paul began to spread in the world, and gradually the original Christian faith became obliterated. We set forth examples of the severity of the opposition to Paul and his theories in the first three centuries. 1. The opposition to Paul commenced from the time when he exploited the decision of the Council of Jerusalem by declaring that the law of Torah had been totally abrogated. In answer to his opponents, Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians. We have established by reference to Encyclopedia Britannica that the opponents of Paul asserted that he was deviating from the teachings of the disciples. These opponents were connected to the old Jewish Christian church, and were led by certain leading figures. 2. The opposition against Paul continued to grow after his letters. James McKinnon McKinnon, p. 121 writes, It is incorrect to assume that the views of Paul or the author of the Gospel of John largely formed the basis of religious belief immediately after the era of the disciples although Paul continued to influence the minds of those times. The theology of the fourth gospel finally became dominant over the churches. 
It is however a reality that the early Catholic Church had thrown out the Paulinian thinking. And in the second century, wherever there were the followers of the Gospel of John, there were also to be found its opponents. Paul's conception of Christianity was by no measure of means the prevailing beliefs at the time for the disciples. 3. In the second century of Christian era. Irenaeus, mentions a sect known as Nazarenebionites. J. M. Robertson McKinnon, chapter 7 writes in this regard. These people denied the divinity of Jesus and did not accept Paul as an apostle. Encyclopedia Britannica quoting Irenaeus states Robertson Jim, p.5. They held that Christ was a miraculously endowed man, and rejected Paul as an apostate, from the Mosaic law to the customs and ordinances of which, including circumcision, they steadily adhered. 4. The views of Paul of Samosata, who was the bishop of Antioch from 260 AD to 272 AD, was almost the same. The depth of his influence could be seen from the fact that he was supported by the schools of Lucian and Arius in the 4th century. 5. Then the sect of Arius in the 4th century raised strong opposition against the doctrine of Trinity in the whole Christian world. The strife and controversy reached such great heights, as may be gathered from the following statements of the well-known Christian scholar Theodoret Britannica, Volume 7, p.881. Disputes and contentions arose in every city and in every village concerning theological dogmas, there were indeed scenes fit for the tragic stage, over which tears might have been shed. For it was not, as in bygone days, when the church was attacked by strangers and enemies. But now nations of the same country, who dwelt under one roof and sat down at one table, fought against each other, not with spears, but with their tongues. The extent of the importance attained by the sect of Arius, and the great number of its followers, may be gauged by the detailed refutation of that sect by St. Augustine in his book on the Trinity. 6. In 325 AD, the Emperor Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea to settle the disputes. The Council rejected the views of Arius. But first of all, McKinnon writes, it is extremely difficult to say that there was present at this council the representation of the entire Christian world. There were very few representatives from the western regions. In all 300 bishops were represented, the majority of whom were Greek. The council did not seriously for a minute consider the theory of Arius. Theodoret writes, the views of Arius were rejected out of hand on presentation, and at that moment they were declared false. What was the result? The words of McKinnon speak for themselves. The party of Athanasius secured victory because it had the support of the emperor. At the same time, the government secured victory in stifling religious opposition by force and suppressing independent religious opinion. James McKinnon has written in detail that despite this decision, the dispute continued for years amongst the people. Especially the Eastern Church was not willing to accept the decision of the council but the government slowly forced its hand on them. The above indicates clearly that there were countless opponents of Paul in the first three centuries of the Christian era. They remain large in number until suppressed by the government. Recent times. Now, we shall quote some views of the Christian scholars of recent times. You will gauge from these that we are not alone in stating that Paul is the founder of Christianity. Those Christian scholars who have studied the Bible impartially have also reached the same conclusion. 1. The Encyclopedia Britannica in describing the condition of Paul states. One group amongst the writers, represented for example by W. Reader, who were by no means opposed to Paul, opine that Paul changed Christianity to such an extent that he has become its second founder. In reality he is the founder of that church Christianity which is totally different from the Christianity brought by Jesus. They say that follow Jesus or follow Paul, but both cannot be followed simultaneously. 2. Although von Lowy Winch is a strong supporter of Paul, he endorses the following statement of W. Reader. Paul separated Christianity from Judaism and gave it a distinct form. Hence he is the creator of those churches which were built in the name of Jesus. Further on von Lowy Winch writes, if there were no Paul, then Christianity would have been a sect of Judaism, and would not have been a universal religion. Is that not an open admission of the fact that Paul changed and altered Christianity to render it a world religion? According to von Lowy Winch, this was a valuable and commendable service of Paul's, but in our view this was really distortion. 3. James McKinnon, an eminent Christian scholar who cannot be said to be an opponent of Paul, himself openly admits. The train of thought is distinctively his own. Whether it is altogether in accord with the mind of Jesus is not so evident in spite of his claim to direct revelation, at the same time. Jesus' conception of the law in itself is hardly in accordance with that of Paul, in this respect Paul's claim that he received his gospel by revelation from Christ is rather problematic. 4. Another biographer of Paul, Folks Jackson, who is his supporter, finally confesses after recording the views of his opponents, if there were no Paul, Christianity would have been different. And if there were no Jesus, Christianity would not have been possible. 
1955, in 1953, a book entitled An Arian Gospel Restored was published in America. The book was jointly authored by Robert Graves and Joshua Fedro. The latter was the son of a well-known Christian bishop. In the introduction to this book, a detailed critique of Paul has been undertaken whereby it is proved that Paul had to a very great extent corrupted the teachings of Jesus, and that the disciples were for this reason displeased with him. The statement of Christian scholars quoted above are at the level of examples. If the views of the opponents of Paul were to be collected, they would constitute a large book. The purpose of citing the views of Christian scholars is to show that numerous Christian scholars have also been forced to concede that the real founder of M-Day Christianity is Paul, and not Jesus. It is hoped that the above-mentioned proofs will convey to a person seeking the truth that the Christianity of today has no connection whatsoever with the teaching of Jesus. It is an innovation of Paul. Hence, this religion should be named Paulnity and not Christianity.